And with that, I'd like to introduce Chris Marshall, Vice President here at Grensbach Glear and Associates, and Jennifer Cunningham, Senior Director of Alumni Engagement at Cornell University. Thank you so much, Anthony. Appreciate it, and thanks for putting all this together. Uh, welcome, everyone. Let me add my welcome to the full group here. Um, we're expecting upwards to 40 people, and we have a smaller group right now, but hopefully we'll have some others join us as we go. Um, let me add a good morning uh, to those who are on the West Coast, uh, good afternoon to those in Central and Eastern, and good evening to those joining us from uh, across the pond. I know we had some folks in the pre-registration that were joining us from uh, a couple schools in the UK and abroad. So just a quick introduction on me. Um, my name is Chris Marshall. I am the Vice President, uh, I am a Vice President at GGNA. Uh, and my focus area is alumni relations. I've had a 12-year career in alumni relations, um, seven years at my alma mater at Lehigh University as the Executive Director of the Alumni Association, and then five years at Cornell University as the Associate Vice President for Alumni Affairs. And in the past five months, I've been full-time working with GGNA as of January 1st of 2013. I've been in the role with GGNA, uh, having served previously for four years while I was at Cornell as an independent contractor working on several alumni relations projects with the firm. So a uh, 12-year career total, and most recently with GGNA, and uh, looking forward to today's uh, webinar. Uh, let me turn it over to Jennifer to give her her own introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Cunningham, and I work at Cornell University in the Metrics and Marketing Department. I've been here at Cornell for six years, I started here on the front lines of customer service, running our entrepreneur network, which does about 40 events a year for that audience. And prior to that, I had my own business uh, doing copywriting for companies like Microsoft and Adobe and others out in Seattle. And prior to that, I was in advertising. So uh, this, what I'm doing now kind of meshes everything that I've done into one job, and it's fabulous. So I look forward to speaking with you today. Thanks, Jennifer, and um, I'll say right out of the gate that Jennifer is to credit or to blame for bringing the NPS reality to uh, the work that we did at Cornell, which led to this webinar. So if you like it, credit Jennifer. If you don't like it, blame me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think you'll find it very interesting. We have a really good system in place that uh, Cornell will show you as an example, and uh, this concept, I think, is one that's going to uh, start to take off in alumni relations. Just quick background on the session today. Um, I'm going to go over um, sort of the, the background and some of the mechanics. Jen Jennifer will jump in on occasion. But uh, at the end, near the end, I should say, Jennifer will provide a very detailed case study of what was done at Cornell under her watch and some really interesting um, sort of real-time, on-the-ground, practical reality that you're going to hopefully put into work at your own institutions. Um, that said, uh, I do know we have most of our attendees are from colleges and universities around the world. There are a few others from other groups. Uh, welcome to all. Uh, we'll try to make this relevant as we can, but uh, the audience that uh, Cornell has worked with, obviously, is with alumni. And then one final reminder before we jump in here is please feel free as we go to ask, ask questions. Uh, raise your hand, virtual hand, and we will call on you. You'll, we'll open up your microphone so we can hear you ask the question and we'll respond, or you can text it, chat it into the chat box functionality at the bottom right-hand corner. So I'm going to flip over to the overview for today. Um, this is what we're going to do. The first four points there, overview in the corporate world, uh, NPS and three steps and example industry scores are going to be the areas I'll mostly cover. I'll have Jennifer jump in on occasion. This is sort of the theoretical overview of, of, of how it works and why it works. And then Jennifer's going to take into the practical world of what, it, what we did at Cornell, and um, I like to describe it as a real-life example, um, lessons learned, and how to introduce this at your institution. So that's the flow of today, so let's dive in. Um, when I started in alumni relations in 2001, I, I found my colleagues in the, on the fundraising side of an advancement shop had a lot of metrics to look at. They had a lot of ways to measure their success, very hard quantitative data, and on the alumni relations side, there were very few. Um, there were the standard things that people were tracking, et cetera, but not a lot of um, good data for me that measured the work that we were doing. And I'll, I'll throw in an asterisk here. My background also includes previous to alumni relations. I was a collegiate swimming coach. And in the sport of swimming, you measured to the hundredth of a second. And every stroke and every lap and every yard is counted. And 
I consider myself a proud data geek, and when I got to the business of alumni relations, I found that we didn't have some of the things that I was used to, and most of it was very qualitative. So to measure the qualitative, we're going to take a look today at this net promoter system. Uh, we think of it as a system, not just a score. You'll hear more about that as we go. This was developed about 10 years ago by Bain and Company, and it's being used by over 1,000 organizations around the world. And what they did is conducted research, and what they looked at was the correlation between customer service survey answers, responses to surveys, and how that correlated to actual behavior. And muddling through the thousands of data points that they came, came upon, they found that the one question that took as much bias and ambiguity as possible out was the one that we're going to talk about today, what they referred to uh, as the ultimate question. And, and, and the question is this, would you recommend this product, this service, this event, in our case we're going to describe today, to a friend or colleague or another graduate? And essentially it's putting your own reputation on the line to uh, promote um, whatever it is that you're asked about here. So the ultimate question is, would you recommend this, whatever it might be? And I'll add at this point that it's, it's not the magic bullet that doesn't answer all your questions, but we think it can help you understand your customers or your alumni better, help improve your programming, help improve your relationship with alumni or with customers. And then last two things here before we move on, just a couple caveats. One, um, there are the cynics out there that will look and see that we're talking about alumni relations as a business or alumni as customers. And I think we got to get past that and think of it conceptually and, 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 and agree that there are business concepts that apply to the work we do in alumni relations. So for the sake of today, when we talk about the word customers, we're referring to alumnus, alumni in general, or constituent, if you're in a different sector. And if we talk about profit, we're talking about engagement or loyalty, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. So these business concepts, I think, apply to the work that we do and are relevant for the measuring of the success of our programs. And then one final thing, um, when I was in the role leading an organization, I often reminded folks as we put these metrics up on the, on the wall and we started talking about them uh, as measuring our success, I often reminded them, this is a way to look at the, um, the work we're doing in a quantitative way. This is a metric, this is a measurement, but at the end of the day, we are in the relationship building business, the people business, it's not about the numbers, so I always remind people about that, um, that this is not just about the metric, but, at the, but there is the truth that we are spending a lot of money, uh, millions of dollars in some cases, on alumni relations engagement programming. And if we can't demonstrate return on investment, um, we're going to have a harder time justifying our existence and getting additional resources. So, so while we're in the relationship business, I, I still think we need to think about the numbers at the end of the day. And Chris, I would just add to that um, the concept of competition um, in a way that we've never seen before. With over a million, a million and a half nonprofits registered in the U.S., the competition for people's time and talent and treasure is fiercer than it's ever been before. And our, quote, competitors are using these kind of metrics now as well. Yep. Great point. I want to touch on that just a second here. Um, these are some companies that are currently using the net promoter system. You'll see for-profit, non-profit companies, some of them on here famous for customer service, and that's what they're really, we're really getting at here is why these companies have gone to this model. Well, they feel that customer service has become the key differentiator in their profits. And there's lots of ways that one can do customer service and measure, but we feel, and I think these companies would feel, that the simplest, easiest, uh, most cost-effective way is this net promoter system we're going to talk about today. And while we're not a business, uh, we are in the business of relationship building and treating our alumni well. And as Jennifer just shared, we're in, the, we're in competition with a lot of other nonprofits today who are competing for mindshare, timeshare, wallet share, et cetera, of our alumni out there. And they're doing things differently from a customer service or, or translate that to stewardship than we're doing in the collegiate realm. You hear stories all the time about smaller nonprofits stewarding donors at a level that we could never do uh, at, a, at a collegiate setting where where a $1,000 gift uh, to a college is considered a, kind of a normal annual fund contribution. For some nonprofits, that's considered a major gift, and they get all kinds of time and attention. So how do you differentiate yourself in the nonprofit world with others who are doing the same? We think this system that we have in place here will help do that. Um, one last comment here. Uh, I'd like to throw out a concept that I'll ask Jennifer to talk about. 
is this notion of loyalty economics. I mentioned loyalty earlier as a proxy for profit. You know, you got engagement and loyalty in there. But this concept here is something I think Jennifer can explain well and help punctuate what we're talking about. Right. So the loyalty economics, and we're in an, an advantage here as universities because we do have a built-in lifelong engagement and relationship with our constituents. But the loyalty economics are something that companies are really looking at um, in terms of everything in their organization. So it's defined as the lifetime value of a customer and looking at not just how much they give in our case, but also their talent and their time and considering how much effort it takes to retain them. So for a very loyal alumnus or customer, getting them to donate or participate is a lot, it costs a lot less. Um, how much they complain when something does go wrong and the time it takes to, to soothe them when things do go wrong, how many mailings it takes to get them to give, how much word of mouth they're doing on your behalf, um, which is especially relevant now in the world of social media. So really understanding who those loyal people are that are, that are promoting your university or your organization without you having to do a lot of staff um, hand-holding or management, those people are golden. And the concept of Net Promoter really tries to get at who those people are so that you can steward that time and talent and make it work for you. On the flip side, it tells you those people that, you know, those volunteers that are giving you an invoice, not a gift, <laughs> and actually take more time to, um, to explain things to, to manage, you, you know the, the people we're talking about. This system helps you weed out who the promoters are and who those uh, detractors are. So here, here's a quick yes or no poll. How many people were nodding their heads as Jennifer were talking about those, <laughs> those loyal alums who are great to work with and those alums that, are, that take a lot of time and don't deliver a lot of value? Uh, I see a few check marks going here. I'm going to check yes because I remember what that felt like as well in my role. And, and spending time with the right people is part of what this is going to help you um, work on here. So let's move on. Thanks, Jennifer. So here's a process at a very high level. We're going to dive into detail in all of these, so you don't have to, you know, you're not going to, not all of this is coming right here. So basically, it's a survey tool. Uh, the examples we're going to use today are around events, programs that we would conduct out on the road or on campus, et cetera. And, and it's an electronic survey that we send out, two to five questions. We started out using a SurveyMonkey tool. They've uh, morphed into a more sophisticated platform called Qualtrics, but there's lots of tools out there. If you Google online surveys, you'll get lots of options and lots of tools to use this. SurveyMonkey is the, probably the most common one. And, and at the end, you get the data, you get numbers, and you review these scores uh, that will come in. And you'll, again, we'll, we'll walk through all this in a bit. But a lot of cases when a survey is conducted, that's it. We stop it. We put it on a shelf or it gets filed away in an electronic folder somewhere and we don't do anything with it. But the rest of it is really where the key comes here. So doing something with the data, the follow-up, this next step here where we're sharing it with staff on the front lines, both on the development and alumni relations side. Again, we'll show you examples of real world um, of how this works. And, and then using it to contact what we call detractors and promoters. You'll see these terms defined in a little bit. But how do you follow up with these people who are your advocates and who are your detractors in this case? So what do you do when you make those calls and how do you use the data in order to um, contact those folks? And then the final piece is this feedback loop, and improving your own product, your customer service, making yourself better by the feedback you've, you've, you've gotten back from these surveys and from these conversations in the follow-up. And what you'll find, um, we'll talk about this in a bit, is you get the most simplest things like location or timing or food quality or speaker, et cetera, are things that people are commenting both positive and negative about on this survey. But you're also going to find you'll get a lot of other issues that are raised that have nothing to do with the event, but um, are, have an act, the alum has an ax to grind in many cases, and they're going to use this event as a, and this survey tool as a platform. But the, the great thing is that you uncover this in the process of this uh, net promoter survey. So let's move on here, and you're going to get some more detail on all this in a bit, so stay tuned. Um, here's an example screenshot of the actual survey. It's, that's it. What you see is on the screen is what was used. That's all we do. Um, it's, it takes less than three minutes. It's boiled down to that ultimate question, the first one, based on your experience, how likely are you to recommend zero through ten? Zero, not at all, or ten would highly recommend. And you'll note that there's nothing on here about venue, food, speaker quality, all that stuff, it comes out 
in the rating for one, it'll come out in the comments they choose to include in the second and third question. Um, and you may recognize the flavor of this question, and, and if you don't see it now, uh, you'll, you'll start to see it in your real life. Because what I found as I started to use this more and more um, companies that I've worked with or uh, vendors that I've used, et cetera, are asking a similar kind of question. I'll give you two examples. One, if you fly United Airlines, uh, within an hour of your flight land, you're going to get an email from them, assuming you're in their, their system, that will ask you about your experience on your flight from Newark to LAX. And they'll say, how was your flight? The first question they ask is, would you recommend United Airlines to another to one of your friends. It's the net promoter score in real life with United Airlines in that case. And the other one I, I saw recently was a restaurant chain where you get the receipt back from the waitress and um, you, uh, there's an online link to a survey where you entered into a contest. If you go to the link, there's incentive for you to go to the link. And, and they ask you to answer a couple of questions. The first question is, would you recommend, I think it was Applebee's in this case, to a, to a friend or a colleague? So more and more companies are using this and you'll see this in everyday life coming out. So the rest of the survey here is, you know, uh, the, the zero to ten question. We'll, we'll talk about it in more detail in a bit. Why did you answer it that way? You'll get sort of responses that are narrative and sometimes very short, sometimes nothing. Sometimes you get a lot of rants and vents in these sections. Anything else you want us to know? Same thing. You get all across the spectrum. And then the most important piece of this whole thing is the is the contact information. This is how you connect the who responded to what they said. Um, and be able to follow up later on uh, and, and check. And you'll note here that we, we actually word very carefully, say periodically you reach out, so you're not committing yourself to doing it all the time, but the way you can um, do this internally is based on your own infrastructure and resources that you have time-wise. So let me pause for a second. Anthony and I talked about this this morning. Let's do a quick poll here. Anthony, I'll turn it to you. You take the wheel here for a second, and let's ask the question about who's surveying their alumni. Go ahead, Anthony, put that up. Okay, everyone, if you could look in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, uh, there should be a poll there that you can uh, start uh, taking and answering your question. Uh, you can start answering the questions to the poll. And while they're doing that, I just want to say, I mean, designing surveys is a whole other webinar, um, but one of the frequently asked questions I get is, well, well what if we really want to know about the food? Or what if we really want to know about the venue, if we should do this next year? And I really urge people not to do that. Um, for a couple reasons. One is that it makes your survey longer and less likely people will take it. For two, it starts to train people that their event fees are all about those tangible things, and they're not. And it also trains your staff to think about this not as being a wedding planner or an event planner where the napkins and the, the food and all of that is the thing that matters. What you really want people to focus on and think about is how did you feel about this event? And yeah, the food might have been bad, but whatever, that happens. It's more about who did you meet? What did you feel when you were at the event? Um, and so if you put questions about food and about parking and that kind of thing and call attention to it, that makes it feel like that's what people care about when that's not really what you care about. You're not, you're not paying your alumni affairs staff to be event planners. You're paying them to be community builders and engagement officers. So just even the little act of doing a survey that includes this more broad kind of thing, which also allows people to complain about the food if they want to, but it's not the focus. Good point. Good point. That, that was proven time and again. Yeah. Um, if that was an issue, we heard about it in these other two questions. Um, yep. It wasn't the focus that we wanted on the event from both sides, both the alumni and the staff side. So, Anthony, why don't you give us I saw you texted me the uh, results, but let's share what you have real time here. Yes, so five people said that they are surveying at the end of their events, and eight said that they're not. One person said that they are using the net promoter system right now, and then 12 said that they are not using the system. Right. right. Maybe the uh, current NPS user can chime in at some point <laughs> and share when we get to the example of uh, – how we did it at Cornell and what Jennifer's doing now, um, and share some of your experiences. We'd love to hear from you, whomever that may be. Um, so I am now the presenter again. Let's move on uh, and get into the uh, – oh, I'm seeing the results there. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, so here's how the calculation works. Um, I'm going to walk you through this very quickly. But basically, on that 0 to 10 scale, your 9s and 10s are your promoters. Your 7s and 8s, they like it, but they're not going to sing your praise necessarily. They're passive. 
Um, the zero to sixes are your detractors, and they may actually tell people, actively go out and tell people how bad of experience they have and will take away from whatever it is you're trying to do. In this case, engage alumni or uh, in increase that loyalty, as we were talking about. And as we were rehearsing for this yesterday, uh, Jennifer shared a really good example that illustrates this. And let me give it a shot. Jennifer, jump in if you think I didn't do it. But um, the example is, is when you talk to your friends and colleagues, uh, et cetera, about restaurants. So here's, here's what I, the real world scenario is this. You're, you're at your institution or wherever you may work, and you're in a city. And your fr you have some friends coming to town. You have an alum who hasn't been in town for a while. Or um, you know, a prospective student and a parent you might know are coming to town. And they say to you, we only got one night in town. Where should we go to eat while we're in town? And all of you immediately, when you thought about the restaurants in your town that you would tell people to go and eat at, thought of a couple that you would tell people, you got to go here. That is a place that you would promote. You're a 9 or a 10. You're on their promoter scale. You're telling people actively that it's a place worth going. And then, and then that visitor says to you, well, we heard about this place, Johnny's. Um, what do you think of that? And you know from your own personal experience and the reputation that it has locally that it's a lousy place. It's a dive, et cetera. The food's terrible. And you're going to say, no, 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 no. You don't want to go there. That's the worst place to go if you're going to have one night in town. You're a detractor. You've given it a zero to six. So you're actively telling people that it's not a place to go. And those dozens of places that you didn't mention or didn't think of are okay for you. Those are your passive. Those are your sevens and eights. So those are the, 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 the um, restaurants in this example that you just wouldn't think to promote to anybody or wouldn't tell anybody anything bad about. They're just sort of neutral in your mind. So mm -hmm. that way, uh, if you think about it in those terms, this is the perfect way to think about the NPS. And the way that the score is calculated here is that you take the percentage, looking at your chart on your screen, of the green section, which is the nines and tens, the percentage of people that responded with a 9 or a 10, you essentially ignore the passives, the neutrals here, and you subtract the percentage of people who were the tractors, the zeros through six, zeros through, through six responses. Jennifer, how to do on my restaurant example? Is that all right? <laughs> Perfect. Well, and then I would just add that you multiply that times, in Cornell's case, we've got 226,000, um, 220, yeah, uh, living alumni. So you multiply that promoting or that detracting by that many people and wow you've got got quite a chorus or you know negative Nellies out there so it's worth knowing who they are. Great point and, and every school has an alumni base of X that's usually in the thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands depending on the size of your school and the more of them you can get up to the nines and tens the better you're going to have that chorus singing and doing the work for you. Mm -hmm. um, so this is through this calculation you'll actually get a score I'm going to show you an example here that you can use to compare yourself over time or your similar events uh, to each other, et cetera. So here's a, a screenshot of an actual result that came back. And I'm going to walk you through it very quickly here. So if you look at the um, chart where you have 9 and 10, a little bar pops up there, you look at the number of responses and the percentage. So what you're going to do is add the 9 and 10, the 29% and 14%, and you get 43. And you subtract those first six percentages. You see the 3%, 0, 1, 1, 4 five and eight, which equal 22%. So the 43 minus 22 equals 21. The NPS in this example is a 21. Um, I'll share with you now that this is relatively low. You'll see um, event scores typically in the 50 to 70 range. We use this example to illustrate that the score could be pretty low. And it, it lends me or leads me right into the comment about recalibration. I often would share with new staff that this NPS score you have to throw, a, throw out completely your notion of what a good grade was when you were in grade school or high school, where an A was in the 90% and a B was in the 80% and a C was in the 70%. If you go into this thinking that's a, good, that's a grade, then you're going to be way off the mark. You have to recalibrate. So 50 to 70 is what you usually see. Um, you'll see a few negative scores for events that just don't go well at all, and you'll have lots of reasons why to follow up with it, and you'll see some examples here in a bit. Um, and then you'll see a few very high scores in the 90 or 100. Typically, those are smaller, very personal kinds of events. Um, the, the other comment I'll make here is that, it, that I also like to look at the 7, 8, 9s, and 10s in total. So if, if you took this population of 100% of the 77 people that responded, 78% of them gave it a 7, 8, 9, or 10. So that's doing pretty good. Almost 80% of the people who attended the event were either neutral or liked it. And um, that's, that's actually pretty good. But in this case, you had a lot of neutrals, and then the score ends up being, again, on the low side here. So um, you'll see some other examples in a moment. 
just just keep that in mind, though, that the score uh, needs to be recalibrated and rethought about against what your norms are in your mind. Jennifer, anything yeah. you want to throw in here? Yeah, so the interesting thing about this event, this is an annual event, and um, in the past we'd seen scores in the 60s, 70s, 50s, and so this year um, when you look at the comments, it's pretty obvious what happened. And so it's a huge learning moment for staff um, to understand what kind of went wrong. It was, a, it was a yellow flag that in the past this had gotten great reviews, and this year there were some things that were just not up to the standard that we had set for the past 12 years that this event has been going on. So that's a really useful tool to, once you start doing this more and more, to compare the same kind of events with each other. Yeah, great point. Um, and again, Jennifer will show you some other comparisons of real stuff as we go into the Cornell example. Let me do a couple other quick slides here. So here's another visual way of thinking about it, and you'll see um, left side, right side, you have two different results. of uh, These are representative of 100 people who attended an event. The left-hand section is a net promoter score of 25%. The right-hand represents a 75%. And a couple things I wanted to share with you on this slide, which, which sort of illuminates this recalibration thing I've been talking about. So, Basically, the yellow smiley faces are your happy people. Those are your nines and tens, your promoters. The grays are the kind of neutral look on the face there are sevens and eights, your, your sort of passives, and then the little mad red face there are your zero to sixes and detractors. And on the left-hand side, you basically have 40% who are saying they liked it and 15% saying they didn't, 45% in the middle who didn't say either they were seven eights. Your net 40 minus 15 is 25. That's your net promoter score. And on the right-hand side, you have 80% of them saying they liked it, but only 5% saying they didn't, and that promoter score ends up being 75%. But what's interesting here is that if you add the 7s, 8s, 9s, and 10s together, on the left-hand example, you get 85% of the attendees were neutral or liked the event, and 95% on the right-hand side, same thing. And I would high-five the event planner for this for either side of it, but the NPS score is very different. I mean, they're having the majority of the people attend the event actually come away neutral or liking it, yet the scores are showing very differently. So this, this is a, a good indicator of how the NPS can quickly get down to a number that can actually, we actually had high performing event planning people on our staff that when they started getting some of their scores, they got depressed about it and we had to really train them to rethink about what a good score is or isn't. And really more importantly is how do you use the data when you get it and Jennifer's gonna get into that in a bit. So the right hand side, 75%, is actually a very good score. And um, if a 75 is really good compared to your grade school days of a 75 being a C, you're gonna quickly uh, learn to not like the system. So you have to really think about training your staff how they uh, receive this data. Um, last couple slides for me and I'm gonna jump it to Jennifer. Here's an example of what you see in industries across the board. So all airlines in who are using this tool, their score on average is 15%. Grocery stores 49 and et cetera. Down the list, you'll note the two negative ones. You're not surprised to see cable television and health insurance. There's more people who are saying negative things than there are people saying positive things about these two industries. Um, and on this next slide, you'll see um, specific companies within various sectors, some of the same from the previous chart, airlines being the first and grocery store the second. Some of these are, are what I would describe as I'm not surprised to see these. I would, I would see my own experiences with these different companies, and I would probably rate them as high as these overall scores are showing, again, on average here. I found it interesting to note that the the best of all the best of the, of the wireless companies, Verizon is at 13% NPS, so shows you how people think about the wireless industry. Um, so that's the mechanic, that's sort of the theory, and again, it's gonna really hit home here when you start to see what um, Jennifer has done, um, what I helped with when I was at Cornell, but now Jennifer's taken it and running with it, She's going to walk you through the process we used at Cornell, um, how it was and how it is currently being used, um, and, and really talk about lessons learned and how do you get this started introducing this to your own institution. So let me turn it to Jennifer. I'm going to go on mute and jump in when needed. Okay. Thank you, Chris. So just to give you a little um, context here at Cornell, we are in a $4.75 billion campaign. We are in alumni affairs like most alumni affair shops. Our goal is to connect Cornellians to each other and back to the university. And we also know that about 30% of all our alumni are either giving, volunteering, and or attending events. 
speaking of events, we do about 1,800 events a year, um, either staff-driven or through our volunteers. That's a lot of events. That's more than one every six hours somewhere in the world you can find a Cornell event. And this is our this is really how we engage with our global audience. It's it's the number one way that, that we reach people. And if you average about 50 people per event, it's 90,000 opportunities to further engage people post-event. And one of the things we've been struggling with here is 1,800 is a lot. Imagine the emails and the, the time it takes for people to put these events on and for what. So people are coming to an event. Does this bring them closer to Cornell? Are they coming to more events? What, what's happening after the event? Um, we didn't really have a way. The staff would come to us and say, okay, you want me to slow down, you want me to do less event planning and more follow-up, but what does that look like? So that's part of why we started exploring the whole net promoter system was, was how can we use the events as an opportunity to further engage people and using the event as the, the impetus for calling people and talking with them about Cornell and their, uh, their engagement. We, we almost think of events as a gateway drug of getting involved, and then what do you do with people afterwards? So we didn't know. Are we really engaging people, or are we just putting on all these events, and we're just sort of, it's a nice to have. People are churning through these events. Um, you know, we, we get nice pictures like this, but are we, can we quantify this happiness and this engagement? Um, I joke that in these days, you actually can. You can hook people up to monitors and look at their pupil size, look at their breathing rates, follow their um, follow their gaze to see if they're truly engaged. We can do this, but um, it's a little awkward at an event when you have everyone hooked up to things like that. So um, instead, we've started using the net promoter, and it really does give us a good indication of how engaged people are at the events. Just to give you some examples, uh, when we first started doing this, the average score for our events was 52. And in 2012, it went up to 60. In 2013, it's up to 63 to 65. And this concept proves what's called the closed loop, um, called closing the loop. And what this means is that we have not done anything extraordinary in our events, um, in planning our events. We haven't hired a company to come in and produce all of our events in the highest professional standpoint. We haven't hired new people that have great event planning skills. What we have done is that after every staff-driven event, we send out the survey. I take a look at the survey and I analyze it, and I have some um, spreadsheets and other systems that I've set up so that I can do this really quickly. And I give the event planners, the um, program managers feedback. And I say, here's your score, and here are the comments, and here's what it looks like happened. Um, you know, great event. Maybe, um, you know, the speaker could have gone on for longer because people really wanted more information about X or whatever. So I give people feedback about every single staff driven event, and just closing that loop and getting them to understand the customer's feedback is, I think, what has raised this score. Um, so some of the things that we've learned from the survey, so it's, again, it's not just about this score, but it's looking at those comments. And one of the things that we've learned, and when I've talked about this with my peers in other nonprofits um, and uh, other colleagues, it's that the detractors, so the people who answered zero to six, were expecting something different. And this, this is all about the marketing. And so I've worked really closely with people to be really explicit in the marketing. So for example, we say the ticket price is $30, includes beverages and food. And then they get there, and what we meant by beverages was water and soda. But then they get to the bar, and it's a cash bar, and that upsets people. So it's just... All we have done, we haven't changed that. We haven't now given everybody free alcohol, but we have changed the invitations to be very explicit when it's in a cash bar or when you have to pay for parking or what the dress code is. Um, when this was a big one too, we used to say the event goes from nine or goes from six to nine. And what we really meant was that the speaker goes on at seven, the reception starts at six. So people would rush, and this was especially true for 
um, for important professionals who would rush to get to the event by 6 o'clock, it doesn't really start until 7. And so they're, they'd be there for an hour networking when they didn't really want that out of the event. So it's those kind of things that, um, that we've learned from the surveys that we've been able to correct. Another reason a lot of our events are networking and people didn't meet the people that they expected to. So what we've done here is we've done a lot uh, before the event. Our registration system now has a, a, a column on it that says, or a box you can fill in that says, who are you looking to meet? And then we send that out to everybody who comes to the event beforehand so that they can beeline for the people that make sense for them to meet from a networking standpoint. As Chris alluded to earlier, they're angry about something else the university is doing, and they use this as an opportunity to give us feedback. And this is fine. This is great. Um, the constructive criticism or just knowing that they're what they're upset about has been really, really helpful. Um, and then there's the things, the specific incident at the event. And this is where things like the bad food or uh, the vendor, the um, acoustics or things like that. This is this is that kind of thing. Um, that people will write about. Okay, so how do we use this data internally? You know, Chris mentioned before that a lot of places will do surveys and then they come back and the program person looks at them and puts it on a shelf. Well, here what we do is we take it one step further and we, we further engage people who came to the event. So what we do is we call the detractors so anyone who answered zero to six will call them up and say, we're so sorry, or sometimes it's an email, that you had a bad time at this event. What can we do to make it better? Um, we can offer them free webinars or other um, refunds if they really request that. Um, but to say that people are delighted and surprised when we call them is an understatement. They're just so not used to that um, from any business, let alone from Cornell. So we, um, if you've read the Harvard Business case study about L.L. Bean and how they turn people around and make a problem into something that people talk about for a lifetime, this is um, an easy way to do that. And I think if you, if you start doing this at your own institution, um, you'll be really surprised how few people actually are detractors. Um, I, I was surprised that we actually have a pretty low number of detractors. Hey, hey Jennifer, um, yeah. before you move on, let me ask a question, maybe it'll break the ice and get some other people to raise their hands or chime in here. How do you find the time to do that? Now, that's mm -hmm. what I'm thinking a lot of people are wondering, how do you do that? And are there examples at other institutions where they've leveraged um, volunteers to help mm -hmm. do this? Yeah, Talk good point. That. So um, that was the number one pushback that I got from our staff is, well, I don't have time to do it. Well. How do you not have time to do it? I mean, the point of going, of getting people to come to an event is to engage them with the university, make them feel better and feel really positive and close to the community that is Cornell alumni. And so somebody goes to this event that you work so hard, you, you've spent anywhere from 30 to 80 hours to, or more to plan an event, someone comes and they're angry. You're just going to let that go? I mean, now you've actually damaged the relationship. So instead of running off to plan yet another event where you're going to upset even more people, why not take the time? Maybe do one less event that week and take the time. It only takes an hour to call people back, and even if you don't speak to them directly, to just leave a voicemail and acknowledge that they that you understand they were upset. I mean, I, I again, I ask the question, how can you not take the time to repair any damage that you've inadvertently done. I think it's well worth it to spend more time on that, maybe do fewer events. Um, and the question about using volunteers, um, I did an, um, an article for, um, for the Case magazine about this, and um, the, um, I spoke with, I think it was USC, which was brilliant. They did a, um, an experiment where they had an event was volunteer driven and after the event they gave the results of the survey to the volunteers who put on the event and then had the volunteers call people and this does so many good things it gets those volunteers involved it um, it you know it, it, another point of engagement it showed the volunteers the fruits of their work because there were also really good comments in there um, and just made them feel more a part of the process so it, using that as a tool, and, and then those volunteers realize the value of this follow-up versus planning yet another event and another event and another event. 
So um, it's um, it, you know it's it's a great tool on that front, and we have not done that yet. That's part of the um, the journey that we're on here with the Net Promoter and integrating it into the uh, into the DNA of our staff. Um, Jennifer, thanks again. Um, yeah. one of the, we have some people who are stepping up here. Thanks. Mark McDonald asked uh, to the panelists, have you ever surveyed event attendees while in the process of leaving an event at a kiosk or with iPads, or do you usually just do it through email? Go ahead and answer that now. I know yeah. you're going to do it later, but go ahead. Well, yeah, so we um, we do it through email now. With webinars, we do it just as you'll see on this webinar. Uh, we can do it so that it pops up right away. Um, we have not yet done it actually at the event because – Really, at an event, what we're trying to do is foster a sense of community among the participants. And to stop the flow and the magic of an event, um, to ask people to do that and get, you know, to get out their phones, now they're on their phones, and while they're doing this, they're checking their email, um, it, it hasn't felt right to do that yet. And, um, you know, with something that we could explore, we do have a way to do um, – it's a poll that allows you to text your response. And, again, I, I haven't really studied it in terms of whether that would be intrusive to an event or not, but it's certainly something worth experimenting for. I appreciate the question. Yeah, I agree 100%. I was going to say, Mark, to your question, I, I would encourage, highly encourage around anything with this is to experiment and try it. See what you get. I think the iPad as you're leaving, you know, coat check or something, you have somebody there, maybe a student saying, hey, would you quick mm -hmm. fill this out? Might be interesting to try. So yeah. even though it may not be done in this example that Jennifer's talking about, experimentation is key. Let's let her get right. back to the um, rest right. of the presentation. We're almost done, and we'll go ahead and take some more questions at the end. Go ahead, Jennifer. Right. Well, and another thing I wanted to say about that is that um, we do set up the survey link to go out immediately after the event. So if people are on the train going home, um, or right when they get home, they'll see the email. So it's not instantaneous, but they do get the email right away. Um, okay, so promoters. We have not done um, as good a job as I would like to about promoters. Um, I would love to start calling them and seeing how they could get further involved, but we just haven't gone there yet. Um, this follow up with key alumni volunteers, I think I already answered that one. Um, and just we shared this kind of data with our trustees and alumni board uh, a couple years ago, and then just in the last trustee presentation we had, two of my colleagues, unprompted by me, um, shared their NPS data with the board of trustees, and so it is becoming part of our DNA, which I'm really happy about. Now, this piece um, is also an interesting, maybe just um, for schools that where alumni affairs and development are closer, um, we would we get a response from a tracked prospect, we send that to their gift officer and we say, okay, John Smith was really happy at this event. When you go visit him next week, you may want to bring it up or John Smith was really angry about something. You should know about this so you can bring materials, um, et cetera. So introducing um, NPS to the organization, as we alluded to, it's just not about the number, and that's a big mistake that I made when I first went out and introduced this to our staff, was I focused too much on the score. And it really isn't about the score. The score is just a yellow flag or a green flag or a red flag to show you, okay, this event, people really would recommend it to other people. They're really engaged. Great. Or, oops, something went wrong. Let's dig into the, um, into the comments and figure out what that is. Starting small, um, I see a question here from um, Ann Coben about whether we do this globally or just for events. And we are going to do this globally in a couple months. We are going to start using this with volunteer experiences. But the advice I got from Fred Reichelt, the father of NPS, was to start small and start with things that um, aren't super high um, engagement, if you will. So it, it, it was just in our shop to do events. And I didn't have to go out and get approvals from the entire university and all of that. It just We started out small with events. We worked on our processes. We got it into the DNA of our staff members. Um, and now we're spreading it now that we really know what we're talking about. 
processes and policies this is one of the reasons we started small. So I've worked out spreadsheets and I have macros and I have systems for putting all of this into place that now that we're going to scale up um, are already in place. Um, and I see a question about are we tracking NPS in our alumni database. Um, when we do the um, all alumni survey that says would you recommend Cornell to a qualified applicant, we are going to put that into the database. And um, but even before we do that, I need to do some math to prove that the loyalty economics I was talking about actually do apply to nonprofits as well. So I'm going to do that first, and then uh, we'll put it into the database. Okay. Um, and headroom. And I spoke about this a little bit before, that the, a huge reason, a huge selling point for doing this is to show your staff and your volunteers that there is something else besides event planning that they can do with their talent. You know, we we pay people a lot of money to uh, build alumni communities and engagement, and if all we have for them to do with alumni are events, and if every time we work on strategies for the year and we say, how many events are you going to do? Well, they're going to try to do a lot of events, and that's not really what we're paying them to do. Um, we're paying them to engage with people and to form relationships and communities, but we haven't given them any other tools, at least here at Cornell we didn't. So this is a great way to say, do half the events you, you were planning on doing, but touch the people who came to those events in a much more meaningful way after the event actually happens. Um, so it's a great excuse, if you will, to slow down and do more quality engagement. Okay. All right, and that's the end of my presentation. I see another question from um, Anne. What kind of benefits from using NPS have you seen for fundraising? Is this quantifiable? Um, we've done some analysis here with um, major gift prospects, for example, and how they answer surveys um, versus um, untracked prospects or non-donors. And it, it makes sense that people who give generally give us higher NPS scores, higher um, in part because of that loyalty economics I was talking about. That if anything does go wrong, they're so invested in the university that they just sort of overlook it. They're not going to give us a bad score just because the food was bad, and they're not going to badmouth Cornell just because they had a bad experience. Um, but we'll get a lot more into that when we do the overall, um, the overall NPS uh, about Cornell. Yeah. The answer a little bit, if I could, Jennifer, thanks. Great job talking through what you've done there. We have just under 10 minutes remaining, and we're going to start taking some more questions from folks. So if you have them, raise your hand or text them in. But let me add to Ann, your, the answer that, to your question is what kind of benefits. The number one benefit that I often talk about uh, is internally where a tracked prospect gives you a high 9 or 10 or a low 0 through 6 rating, and you let the gift officer know that mm -hmm. that – result has come in. That is gold to them. That gives yeah. them a contact point to, to turn a detractor into a promoter, fix a problem, or to just to follow up with somebody who had a great experience and say, hey, I heard you went to the blank event and you enjoyed it. Great. Um, is there more information I can get you on that? Whatever it might be, with the internal benefit of, uh, of identifying who the track prospects were who responded to the survey, high or low, letting the gift officer know was the single best benefit that I would say came yeah. from starting this process. Yep, and and it will. So another question is, have you identified better or new prospects through NPS responses? Um, uh, yes, and we will even more when we ask the broader question about Cornell. Um, and it's it's kind of interesting. We have a, a business intelligence group here that does analytics, and they're working on one of these um, uh, predictive modeling, and they're taking into account all these different things, and it's this pretty complicated formula. It's taking them months. Um, and so I'm sort of in an arm wrestle with, the director of that to say, okay, I'll do my NPS and we'll correlate that with the one number and the giving, and you do your complicated thing over here and we'll see where we end up. Um, in the profit world, the beauty of the net promoter is that it identifies your promoters and the people that you should be spending more time with so easily um, that I'm, I'm confident that that will happen here too. So, um, um Go ahead, Jennifer. I saw this question here from Katie Edwards. Do you worry about over-surveying? Yeah. Um, uh, over-communicating with alumni? And she yeah. had to follow. But go ahead. Yeah, so um, I get that question a lot. And the fact is, when we do 1,800 events a year, 
just last month, we sent out a million and a half emails to people, inviting them to events. Um, so over communicating with alumni, absolutely, it is a huge problem. But communicating with people who have already come to an event about that event, asking them what they thought about that event, that is good communication versus spamming people with events that they don't care about. Um, so I don't worry about that. That's another, and the over surveying um, is also, because it's only four questions and because it's very relevant to that event and it's asking for feedback, um, no, I don't worry about it. And the data shows that out that we do not, we have not seen over the past um, three years that we've been doing this, we have not seen a decline in the number of people that respond. So I don't worry about that. The follow-up question that Katie asked was, do you ask senior staff attending the event to complete the survey? Mm -hmm. um, we send it to them. Whether or not they uh, fill it out is up to them. Um, but yeah, we they generally give us their feedback in other ways, but it's also been useful for our program directors to go um, in the debrief if it's a big event and we have a kind of staff post-mortem to bring the survey things. And so if Mr. VP comes and says, oh, that was awful, I heard all these anecdotes about the location or the speaker, you can say, well, yeah, you're right on, here's the survey data. Or, you know what, actually that was just two really loud people and they weren't even alumni, so, you know, it, so it gives us tools to, um, to communicate with internal partners as well. Great. Um, Mark McDonald asked a question here. Uh, how do you foresee yourself gathering your responses from major donors when the time comes for you to experiment mm -hmm. measuring satisfaction with the major giving experience? Email, in person, perhaps by an outbound student phone call or the like? Can you tackle that now or do you want to do that offline with Mark? Very interesting. Well, we haven't done that yet and I'm not sure that we're going to go there. Um, we might do it with the annual fund, um, but the major gift experience is so personal. Um, it would be great to do it. I'm just not sure I can sell it to Cornell. Um, it's a, it would be a huge mindset change. So maybe in five years when we've really got this universal, um, I can introduce that, but that's a great question. Um, Mark, if you want to follow up on that, you can send my stuff's on the screen here. Please send me a note or give me a call, and I can get you in touch with Jennifer for the real world example there. But uh, happy to dig deeper into that. But again, a good question. Uh, Anthony's asking if we could uh, open up the post webinar survey. Anthony, give me one second. I want to just end with um, I'm going to send a text out to all participants or chat, I should say, here. Um, there's a book that I would recommend if you want more information on this. I dug it out today and was reading through it again. Um, there's their first edition, and there's this ultimate question 2.0, the second version of the of the book, which I think is an excellent read. It's a good airplane book. Uh, if you're traveling, grab it and read it on your next flight. Uh, Fred Reicheld is the is the uh, is the godfather of all this. Uh, someone who Jennifer's gotten to know personally, and this book is a great resource. I recommend that highly. So the ultimate question 2.0 is the title. Jennifer, anything you want to add to that? Uh and they also have got a website that explains a lot more um, specific questions and, and things. And I also have a bunch of um, resources that I can share. If just email Chris and he'll pass you along. Great. So Anthony, go ahead. Let's let's open up uh, the uh, survey for the end, the post event survey. And keeping in mind what you just heard, I'm hoping no, <laughs> I don't try to bias it at all. <laughs> Hi everyone, this is Anthony again. Uh, any questions that we did not get to during the session, we will send out with a transcript with the recording and the slides that were used today. So if you have any more questions, feel free to chat them in right now. Yeah, if you have questions that didn't get asked, just throw them in the chat box and then like as Anthony said, we will come up with answers for you that will go out to everybody at the end. And then anything follow up in more detail, for me or for Jennifer, my contact information is here, but I can easily get you to Jennifer as needed. In fact, it's jennifer.cunningham at cornell.edu. Couldn't be any easier. So um, you're welcome to reach out to either of us. Both of us have talked about this extensively and uh, can certainly help you out. So we're at our uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time, 1 p.m. Central witching hour here. Anthony, any final housekeeping closing comments that people need to know or are we, are we good? 
We're all set. Thank you all for attending today. Thanks, everybody, very much. And let me special thank you to Jennifer, who did this as a favor to me. So, Jennifer, well done. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.